There are tunnels all over the world which are used for various reasons. Cars travel through tunnels to help them get to their destination more efficiently. People dig tunnels to mine for gems or precious metals. There are tunnels underground to route utilities throughout the city. We pass through these tunnels as they appear without giving it a second thought. We assume as we enter one end that we will soon come out the other side, safe and sound. Sometimes though, we don't make it to the other side. On October 11, 1923, Southern Pacific's No. 13 train, the Portland-San Francisco Express, was right on time as it pulled into the station in Ashland, Oregon at 11.10 a.m. When the train stopped in front of the Depot Hotel, passengers brushed by each other as they got off and on the train. The engine was fully fueled and ready to continue west to San Francisco. Now, you don't need a geography degree to know that San Francisco, California is not west of Ashland, Oregon. That was just the way Southern Pacific labeled the rail. Anything traveling toward San Francisco was considered going west, and anything traveling away from San Francisco was considered going east. Who am I to argue? At the Ashland station, the crew of the train also changed over. 52-year-old engineer Sidney Bates took over control of the train. Sydney had started working for Southern Pacific in 1894 and was promoted to engineer in 1899. Working with him was 23-year-old Marvin Sang, who had been working as a fireman for Southern Pacific since 1918. A fireman on a train was the person who attended to the fire that ran the boiler for the steam engine. They were also joined by brakeman Charles Coyle Johnson, who wasn't working on the train, he was just hopping a ride at a different location also known as deadheading. It was one day before his 37th birthday. Train 13 was loaded with baggage, which that day consisted of fresh fish. The train had four baggage cars that were equipped with racks that were used to continually ice fresh fish during transport so it didn't go bad. There was also a mail car that was tended to by U.S. mail clerk Elvin Doherty. On this trip, the mail car was overflowing with bags of mail. This was not Elvin's normal shift. He had swapped shifts with another mail clerk. The trip through the Siskiyou Mountains took them through two tunnels, number 15 and number 14, before arriving at the Siskiyou station. The buzz of activity began again as passengers got off and on the train and baggage was moved. Paul and Belle Dutremont knew they wanted a large family. Vern was born on January 1, 1899, followed by twins Ray and Roy, who were born on March 31, 1900. They took a couple of years off, having moved to Arkansas in 1902, before having Hugh, who was born on February 21, 1904. Their last child, Lee, was born in 1907. By this time, the family was living in Colorado. Paul seemed to be easily attracted to the greener grass of other locales, so in 1904 the family moved to Cripple Creek, Colorado. The gold fields had brought an influx of people and it meant lots of business for Paul who was a barber. Though successful in Colorado, Paul believed he had found greener pastures again in 1909. He sold everything he owned and bought a piece of land in Lakewood, New Mexico, believing it was a lush green paradise. After the 800-mile trip in a horse-drawn wagon, the family was devastated when they saw their new piece of land was nothing more than a dry, bare piece of desert. This development created tension between Paul and Belle that ended in a fight where Paul knocked his wife to the floor, so she had him arrested. Once out of jail, he went back to Colorado. He eventually remarried and moved to Salem, Oregon. By now, Ray and Roy were 16 years old and were tired of their lives in New Mexico. Ray left first, planning to just explore the country, and Roy followed shortly after. Coincidentally, they both ended up in Oklahoma City, where they enrolled in Barber College. 
By the time the First World War began, Roy had completed barber school and had his own shop in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. With the war going on, Roy was making a great living as a barber for the new soldiers being trained for combat. Ray had dropped out of barber college and spent time riding the rails. In 1918, Ray found a job at a shipyard in Vancouver, Washington. Ray had also gotten involved in a radical labor movement, and after tension turned to murder, Ray was arrested in Vancouver for just being a member of the movement. He was sentenced to a year in the Washington State Reformatory in Monroe, Washington, which is now the Monroe Correctional Complex. When Roy received word that Ray had been arrested, he sold his barber shop for $100 and took a train to Oregon. When Ray was released from prison in 1921, he was resentful of the world around him. Roy had stayed in Oregon, taking a job at the Oregon State Mental Hospital in Salem. Ray lived with Roy for a while and tried various jobs, but nothing stuck. He eventually decided to take a cue from the other inmates at the prison and turn to a life of crime. He took a train to Chicago to look for some of the criminal gangsters that he had heard about in the clink, but he was unable to make any connections. When he returned to Oregon, Roy had quit his job and was ready to join his brother in a life of crime. They just needed one big score that would set them up forever. The men traveled the coast and stopped at various logging camps, trying to make as much seed money as they could to plan a big heist. Their initial plans involved robbing a bank. They cased a few banks in Oregon and southern Washington, but all the targets they considered were not set up well for an easy crime, either too far from the cover of woods or too close to the local police station. Roy and Ray had been reading newspaper articles about criminals robbing mail cars on trains and walking away with millions of dollars. They adjusted their plans from robbing a bank to robbing a mail car. Their younger brother, Hugh, was now living with them and they asked him if he wanted to be involved. He considered his future options and didn't hesitate to join in on the planned heist. All three men worked at a logging camp for about six months, saving as much money as they could. When a lumber strike was called at the end of August 1923, the brothers took that as an opportunity to start putting their plan in motion. They began driving up and down the coast, looking for the best place to hit the mail car. They settled on Tunnel 13, just after the Siskiyou station of the westbound train. They decided on the number 13 train because it was always on time. Ray had also heard rumors that this train regularly had large quantities of gold in the mail car. He would later say that he couldn't remember where he heard that. He thought it might have been in a hobo camp in New Mexico. You know, reliable sources of information. On one of their drives, they found a construction site where they stole a box of dynamite, some blasting caps, and a detonator. Their plan was to set up a camp that they could retreat to after the heist. They would store food and supplies at the camp so they could hide out in the woods until they were able to make their escape. They found a good spot to make camp, but then they stumbled upon a cabin that the locals referred to as Mount Crest Cabin and decided to use it as their base camp. Their plan would be to hijack the train, uncouple the engine and the mail car from the rest of the train, and have the engineer move further down the tracks as they pillage the mail car. Then they would kill any witnesses and return to the Mount Crest cabin to lie low after the heist. The brothers had managed to get their hands on some weapons. All three of them had a 45 caliber pistol, and Ray also had an automatic 12-gauge shotgun. On October 11th, 1923, they got to the tunnel early and placed the dynamite and detonator outside of the west end of the tunnel. With Ray staying on the west side of the tunnel, Roy and Hugh walked the path that went between the tunnel openings and waited near the area that the train would do its brake check before it entered the tunnel. As the train slowed down to prepare for its brake test, Hugh hopped on the train, but the train had already started accelerating and Roy was having trouble keeping up. Hugh stuck his leg out and Roy grabbed a hold, pulling himself onto the train, but his pistol fell out of his pants as he worked himself up onto the train car. Hugh moved to the engine and ordered Sidney Bates to stop the train with the cab just clear of the tunnel on the west end or else he would die. Roy grabbed Marvin Sang and told him that if the engineer didn't stop the train with the cab just clear of the tunnel on the west end, he would be the new conductor because Sid would be dead. They both agreed. With the engine car outside of the tunnel and the mail car just inside, Hugh took Sid and Marvin off the train and held them at gunpoint a few yards away. 
At the same time, the mail clerk, Elvin Doherty, opened the metal door to the car and looked out, wondering why the train had stopped. Ray attempted to shoot toward Elvin, but he missed and the clerk slammed the door shut. Ray claimed later that he was not intending to hit Elvin, but just to scare him into cooperating. Once in the mail car, he wanted to use the clerk to point out the most valuable cargo. Ray didn't wait long before he resorted to using the dynamite. Roy grabbed the wires that he had run from the detonator into the tunnel prior to the train arriving. He then placed the dynamite at the door into the mail car and connected the wires to the blasting caps. He didn't just use a couple of sticks, he put all of the dynamite against the door. Ray was distracted and didn't notice the amount of dynamite being used, so when Roy jumped from the train and pushed down the plunger on the detonator, everyone was shocked at the massive explosion that shook the mountain. People all the way back at Siskiyou Station heard the explosion and they thought that the train's boiler might have exploded. The tunnel was filled with smoke and the mail car was destroyed. Shreds of burnt mail littered what remained of the mail car and the tunnel. Elvin Doherty died instantly. Roy grabbed Ray's 45 and took Marvin with him to see if they could still uncouple the engine and mail car from the rest of the train. They didn't even make it to the back of the mail car before they were overcome by smoke. Roy used a flashlight to look into the mail car, but there was nothing of value. There were definitely no wooden cases that were normally used to transport gold. While Roy was searching for valuables, he saw someone coming toward him, holding a flare. It was Coyle Johnson, the brakeman that was deadheading from the Siskiyou station. When he saw Roy, he asked who he was, but Roy just responded, None of your business. Roy told Coyle to uncouple the mail car, but the brakeman explained that it was damaged and they would have to pull the car forward so it was out of the tunnel. Roy then told him to walk to the end of the tunnel and tell the other men to have the engineer pull the train forward. Coyle did as he was told, but as soon as he approached Ray and Hugh, both brothers turned and shot without hesitation. Coyle was hit by both men and fell to the ground. Roy went out to the end of the tunnel to find out why the train wasn't moving and saw Coyle dead on the ground. He told his brothers that the train needed to move forward. They ordered Sid to move the train, but he said it wouldn't work. The explosion had damaged something significant in the train's drive system and they were stuck where they were. Later, the conductor would say that when he reached the engine, certain valves were shut in a configuration that would have been done intentionally. It looked as though Sid may have been able to move the train, but didn't, hoping that the bandits would give up and not end any more lives. It's impossible to tell what Sid's intentions were, though. If Sid was hoping the men would cut their losses and leave without any more death, he was wrong. Ray told Roy that they no longer needed Marvin, so Roy put his gun to Marvin's head and pulled the trigger. Hugh put his pistol to Sid's head and also pulled the trigger. With four bodies and nothing to show for it, the Dutremont brothers cut their losses and fled the scene. They left everything behind besides their firearms. Well, beside the one that Roy lost. The men had made no attempt to make a map or any type of instructions to help them find their way back to Mount Crest Cabin. First Hugh, believing he knew the way, led them through the forest, but only ended up getting them lost. Eventually, Roy found the way back to their hideout hours later. Other rail workers made their way to the engine of the train, still thinking they were dealing with a blown boiler. When they saw Sid, they initially thought he was injured in the explosion, but then they realized that the boiler was still intact. When they found Marvin and Coyle, both dead from gunshot wounds, they realized that there had been a train robbery, or at least an attempt at one. When someone finally crawled into the mail car to search for Elvin, they found his remains scattered around the car. As the brothers were lost in the woods, more and more people began arriving on the scene. Jackson County sheriffs, a postal inspector, and 30 members of the Oregon National Guard deployed to the area. Authorities found a discarded pair of coveralls. When searched, they found a small piece of paper that was wadded up and stuck down at the bottom of the coverall's pencil pocket. It was a post office receipt for $50 being sent from Roy Dutremont in Eugene, Oregon to Vern Dutremont in Lakewood, New Mexico. When authorities went to the address, they spoke to Paul who told him that his three sons had gone on a hunting trip but hadn't returned when they were supposed to. They also found that the gun dropped by Roy was registered to William Elliott, but the handwriting on the permit application matched Roy's handwriting. 
Authorities had the names of the men responsible for the destruction of the mail car on train 13 and the deaths of four men. They placed rewards for $4,800 on each fugitive, but it would take them years before they would finally bring them to justice. Back at the Mount Crest cabin, the brothers laid low for as long as they could, but as their supplies ran out, they decided to have Ray travel to Eugene to retrieve their car. He quickly realized that he wouldn't make it to Eugene, so he got a job picking apples at an orchard that also provided room and board. He needed to make some money to bring back to the hideout. Ray picked apples for a few days and then made his way back down to the hideout. The brothers spent a month hiking through the woods trying to find a way to make it out of the area without being caught. Once they made it over the border into California, they made the difficult decision to split up. They all took on assumed names. Roy continued using the name William Elliott, Ray used the name Johnny Johnson, and Hugh went by James Price. They planned to write each other at the post office in Santa Ana, California in 30 days. If they weren't able to keep in contact, they made a plan to meet at the YMCA in New York City on January 1, 1928, more than four years after their failed heist. After splitting up, Roy and Ray both worked various farm jobs in California and the two brothers managed to stay in touch. Ray had saved enough money to make it to Detroit and found a job there. He convinced Ray to join him, but after arriving, the fugitives started noticing that detectives seemed to be watching them. Ray had the idea to get to an island off the coast of North Carolina that was a safe haven for criminals. After riding the rails and talking to the other hobos, they learned that the island was not a great option. They eventually found an unoccupied shack and laid low for a while, trying to shake the detectives who had been tracking them. They did some odd jobs to make some money and soon moved to Sulphur Springs, Ohio. Here, Ray and Roy claimed that they were brothers Elmer and Clarence Goodwin. Ray, or Elmer, met and married a 16-year-old named Hazel Sprouse. By this time, Ray was bleaching his hair blonde and had told a dentist that one of his front teeth hurt, so he could have it removed. Soon, Ray and Hazel had a child together. It seemed that Ray was getting comfortable, settling into a new life as if he was in the clear from his past life of crime, but the comfort wouldn't last long. While on a trip, Roy started seeing new wanted posters. These did not include details about Hugh, and the picture of Ray matched his current appearance. Fearing that Hugh was already in custody, the brothers decided that it was time to get out of the country and started making plans to flee to Mexico. After the separation, Hugh made it to Mexico. He found out there were just as many wanted posters up in Mexico than there were in the States. From there, he traveled to Chicago and enlisted in the Army. Somehow, the military didn't recognize him, and after completing training, he was shipped overseas to Manila in the Philippines. This would have been the perfect place for Hugh since there were no wanted posters in the country. When one of his sergeants returned to the U.S. and saw Hugh's image fetching a $4,800 reward, he contacted the postal investigators and told them about Private James Price. Hugh was arrested in the Philippines on February 11, 1927 and charged with first-degree murder. After receiving a tip that the Goodwin brothers were likely the Dutremonts, investigators posted an employment ad for a good-paying job at a mill in the area the brothers were living. When Roy showed up to the employment office to apply, he was arrested on June 8, 1927. They had hoped that both of the brothers would arrive at the employment office, but now that they had Roy, they were able to confirm that the Goodwins were in fact the Dutremonts. They went to the house of Ray and Hazel, and when Hazel, who was now pregnant with Ray's second child, answered the door, they told her that Roy was injured on the job and was in the hospital. She ran to Ray, who was sleeping, and he threw on some clothes and hurried out of the house. He was taken into custody the same day as Roy. Roy and Ray were extradited back to Oregon, where Hugh's trial had just begun. Hugh had pled not guilty, and the trial first ended in a mistrial due to an ill juror. Eventually, Hugh was found guilty of first-degree murder, and though the prosecution wanted the death penalty, he was sentenced to life in prison. The evidence against Hugh was circumstantial, and there was no eyewitnesses to link Hugh to the crime. Roy and Ray were offered deals for life imprisonment, and they both pleaded guilty to four counts of first-degree murder. All three were taken to the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem. Roy was the first to leave the prison. 
1949, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and transferred to the Oregon State Hospital. There, he was given a frontal lobotomy, which damaged his brain and left him an invalid. He was transferred to a nursing home in 1979 and granted parole in May of 1983. He died just three months later at the age of 83. Hugh was paroled in December of 1959 and moved to San Francisco, where someone had helped him set up a job as a printer at a newspaper. He was diagnosed with stomach cancer and died three months later at the age of 55. Ray was paroled in October of 1961 and moved to Eugene where he worked as a janitor at the University of Oregon. Hazel had not officially divorced him until the mid-50s, after 25 years of marriage. She eventually remarried and lived in West Virginia with Ray's two sons. Ray eventually moved to a nursing home and died in December of 1984, at the age of 84.